been doing Swamiji for quite some time. There's an institute for the study of Vedanta and Sanskrit in the Pocono Mountains in Pennsylvania called Arsha Vidya Gurukulam. It's a residential facility for the study of Arsha Vidya, which is the traditional knowledge of the scriptures of India. And they teach yoga, Sanskrit, Vedanta, and related uh, disciplines. So if you're not familiar with the Indian tradition, um, you may be asking, you know, what's this Swami business, right? Is the Swami someone who just likes to wear bright orange clothes and have such polysyllabic names that you have to take a breath before you can finish the, his name? Um, there's a beautiful verse that goes, Lokesvin Vedanishta Pura Prokta Mayanaka Jnana Yogena Samkhyanam Karma Yogena Yoginam and it, it basically talks about the two, two approaches to a spiritual life. One, on one hand, is fully engaged. One is fully engaged in the world, has relationships, is, it has a family, contributes to the GDP. And what's unique about this path is that, this committed lifestyle, is that one sees every opportunity, one, one sees every experience in one's life as an opportunity for awakening for quieting the mind, for opening the heart, and becoming alive to what is. So everything is grace, prasadha bhuti. And at the same time, everything is an offering. Someone who is a karma yogi who has this engagement in the world approaches all situations and tries to, to address every situation with as much compassion and as much um, vairagya, as much understanding about the objectivity regarding things as possible. And the other path into which one grows from this first approach is called sannyasa. And that's a path of renunciation. It's, uh, the, the, um, it's for one who has seen the glitter and the shiny things for what they are in the world and has prioritized his activities and his attention, his or her activities or attentions, to what is actually the most important in the world. And that's what a swami is. A Swami takes a vow of, of um, abhayam and ahimsa. Ahimsa means causing no harm, living very gently in the world. And abhayata, abhayam means fear. Abhayam means fearless. Abhayata means fearlessness. So a Swami, a, a Hindu monk, a sannyasi, is one who lives fearlessly because it takes a second thing to become fearful of. And in a, in a sannyasi's vision, there is no second thing. When he sees you, he sees himself, and there's nothing to be fearful of. And at the same time, he lives a life so he's not a competitor. He's not, um, no one should take him as, as trying to elbow his, uh, his way in to share these scarce resources that we all seem to be clamoring for. So the name Swami, Vididatma Ananda Saraswati, it's a mouthful, right? Mm -hmm. So what's a Swami? A Swami is one who has this vision. A Swami is one who's yukta, who is, in a sense, self-possessed, who, who's, you could say, whose cravings and desires have been reduced to mere preferences. Saraswati, Swami Vidadakmananda Saraswati. Saraswati is actually the name of the goddess of knowledge. And it's a name given in the Dashanami order to people who have been initiated into this renunciate tradition. And it's in a sense of uh, asking for the blessing of the goddess of knowledge to come and manifest through that particular individual. And so lastly, Vidita Atma Ananda. It can be taken a couple ways, but simply, Vidita means known, well known, well ascertained. Atma means oneself. Dididatma is one whose self is very well understood, very well known. And why is that important? Why is that meaningful? Because of the ananda. Ananda is that which we're all seeking in all of our attempts, all of our activities, in all of our, our um, approaches to life. Everything we seek, we're seeking that completeness, that fullness, that sense of lack of limitation that we constantly experience. So a Swami is one who finds that completeness, that fullness, that, that, um, that sense of, of at-homeness 
in the self, which is very clearly well known. And that Swami has the capacity to communicate that through the sampradaya, through the teaching tradition to the student. And this teaching goes down from teacher to student, teacher to student, teacher to student. So we're in the presence of a great teacher. I've had the privilege of listening to him a number of times and attending a number of camps. And uh, I think we're all very blessed to have him here. It's <coughs> so please uh, turn your cell phones off and give your full attention to Swamiji. Um, at the end, please stay around for a couple quick announcements about upcoming programs. Thank you. Discussion this evening is freedom from sadness. <clears throat> sadness is a typical human problem. There are living beings other than human beings with sadness. Depression, these are the problems that a human being suffers from. You never see a street dog depressed, sitting in a corner with long face, a dog or a cat or a cow or a buffalo or a bird. You don't see sadness, depression in them. Whereas, the sadness or depression is a typical human problem and unfortunately every human being is suffering from sadness in one degree or the other. So what is, so, what is unique about human being? What is it that distinguishes a human being from other living beings that makes him susceptible to the sadness. It is what we call self-consciousness. A human being, that is you and I, are conscious of ourselves as well as the conscious of the world. You might say that even Swami, even a dog also is conscious. It is true. A dog also is conscious of itself. And perhaps seems to know itself as a dog because it reacts one way when other dogs are there and reacts differently when cats are there. So I guess some kind of self-consciousness is there. A human being is so sensitive that not only there is self-consciousness, there is self-judgment. I am conscious of myself. At the same time, I have an opinion about myself. As to who I am, how I am. It is the nature of our intellect. We have been blessed with an intellect with which we learn, we decide, we analyze, we conclude. It is the nature of the intellect to judge. And therefore, intellect judges whatever it is it comes in contact with. For example, I'm sitting in front of you, your intellect is bound to have some or the other judgment of the Swami who is sitting here. Seems to be all right. Looks strange. You see, he knows what he's talking about. Something everybody may have their own opinion. Which may change, of course. But whatever it is that we confront, we immediately have a judgment or an opinion about whatever it is 
that we confront. That is the nature of our mind or nature of our intellect. And the first thing that I am aware of, or first thing that I am conscious of is myself. I am always conscious of myself. I am conscious of the world also, but it is possible that I may not be conscious of the world around me, but I am conscious of myself anyway. And since I am conscious of myself, I have an opinion or judgment about myself. Thus, every human being has an opinion or judgment about his or her own self. What is the nature of the opinion? What kind of opinion do I have myself? Generally, the opinion is that I am a limited being. I am a lacking or wanting being. This is what I find myself to be. And whenever I become aware of my lack or want or limitation or inadequacy, whenever in my opinion I find myself to be an inadequate person. Inadequate means not being able to live up to my own expectation of myself. Then I become unhappy with myself. I have lots of expectations of myself. I want to see myself a successful person. See myself as always right, always successful, always under control. This is what my expectation is of myself. Sometimes I'm right, sometimes I'm successful, sometimes I'm in control. Meaning that there are times when I find that I am acceptable in my own judgment, in my own perception, whenever I am able to live up to my own expectation of myself, I find myself satisfied with myself, happy with myself. Then I am happy. However, whenever I find that I am not up to my own expectation, in a test, I have an expectation that I should score SAT, say 2200 points, and I got 1900 points. I feel I'm not alright, I'm no good. I expected 1900 and got 2100. I'm very happy with myself. I think I am something, I'm, I'm successful, I'm good, I'm adequate, I'm capable. Just almost constantly a commentary is going on in my own mind about what I am. I am all right, I am not all right. In my own perception, in my own judgment, you may declare me to be all right. Our Dakshani may give a wonderful description of the Swami. That is his perception. But whether in my perception I am a learned person, I am this so and so, I have my own perception which may or may not necessarily agree with his or somebody else's perception. Meaning that it is quite possible that the world may declare me to be a great person, but I may not declare myself to be great. And what is important is what I declare myself to be. Of course, I am constantly striving to get an approval from the world. I am striving 
to live up to the expectations that the world has of myself, I am striving to live up to those expectations. I want to be acceptable to the world. I want to be approved by the world. Why is that so? So that if the world finds that I am acceptable, I think that I must be acceptable, I must be alright. Meaning that very often I look at myself through the standpoint of the world. The world says that I am a great person. I think that I should be a great person. Because I do not think very highly of myself. A human being generally has a low self-esteem, does not think very highly of himself or self. Our Swami says, tells the joke that here is Miss Universe. This woman universe, that's what it means. So now the world is declared. So now she should be assured that she is the most beautiful woman, right? So there should not be any need now for her to make up her face from tomorrow because she is already the most beautiful. But no, if she was spending one hour every day for makeup, after being declared Miss Universe, she may perhaps spend two hours. <coughs> she is not sure. They think that I am beautiful. I do not know. Thus, what is most important for me is what is my opinion about myself. This is not understood sometimes. And the reason why very often I give importance to the opinion of others is because when others have a good opinion about me, then I think that I must be good. There's a constant need on my part to feel good about myself. A constant need. A constant need on my part to accept myself, to be acceptable to myself, to be satisfied with myself, to be acceptable in my own judgment. My usually a very harsh judgment about myself, it is not easy for me to really become successful in my own judgment. So this is the root of the problem called sadness for a human being. Self-consciousness and self-judgment. Also, a general habit of not judging oneself in a very kind manner. Usually judging oneself as inadequate or not being able to live up to my own expectation. And therefore, generally I am sad. Sadness arises from self-non-acceptance, self-dissatisfaction. And the self-non-acceptance or self-dissatisfaction arises whenever I find that I am not adequate, when I am not able to live up to my own expectation of myself. <coughs> so, what I am trying is constantly seeking to become acceptable to my own self. There are moments when I do find myself acceptable, then I am happy. There are times when I find myself not acceptable to myself, not being able to measure to my own expectation, then I become unhappy. <clears throat> so this is very important thing to understand. <coughs> Happiness and unhappiness has nothing to do with anything other than myself, outside of myself. It has to do only with myself. I'm happy when I am satisfied with myself. I accept myself. I think that I'm alright in my perception. And I'm unhappy whenever I find myself not acceptable to me in my own perception. What happens with this expectation is 
that as I keep on meeting my expectation of myself, unfortunately, my expectations of myself keep rising. That's a problem. That one point I may have been satisfied, why I satisfied, if I score rank in first five in my class, I was happy. But as I did that, then slowly my own expectation, I should be in the first three, first two, I must be number one. Then not only in my class, in the whole school, not only in the whole school, in the whole district, not in the whole district, thus I keep on raising my expectation of myself. And therefore, this possibility of my not accepting myself, of my not being able to live up to my own expectation keeps rising, not falling. And therefore, this problem of self-non-acceptance or self-satisfaction generally remains. In that sense, a human being is usually a sad creature. That's the reason why we very often or generally avoid ourselves. I avoid being with myself. I keep myself engaged in one or the other activity so that I do not have to confront myself. Many of our activities are nothing but the escape distractions, escaping from my own self. Therefore, I work very hard for a vacation. And what do I do in vacation? I was, I'm tired. I need rest. But do I take rest? Maybe for a few hours. And then I find out some activity for us. Even in the evening, I come home tired from work. And I may have a few minutes of quieted with myself. I come home, sit in my favorite chair, have a cup of coffee, enjoy it for a few minutes, and then I pull out a newspaper, switch on TV, my cell phone, do something or the other. Meaning that I engage myself in activity to escape from myself. There's nothing wrong in activity, nothing wrong in doing something. What is that that actually compels me that I am compelled to do something? Doing something is one thing and being compelled to do is another thing. I am compelled because I am not comfortable with my own self. Therefore, I take a vacation in which I work so hard that I need another vacation after coming back. So this is the life of a human being. Whether I am a, a lowly worker digging ditches, or I may be working a white collar worker you know, in some corporation, or a doctor, a lawyer, an engineer, an executive, a wealthy person, a leader, whoever I am. This business of self-judgment and putting oneself down does not leave anybody. And therefore, happiness is self-acceptance, unhappiness is self-non-acceptance. And unfortunately, that's the reason why the reason why I pursue one endeavor after the other is to hopefully become that by which or so that I will become acceptable to myself. So right now I think that if I become so and so, I will be acceptable to myself. If I do such and such thing, I will be acceptable to myself. Thus, behind every pursuit, there is this one agenda or one desire 
Either you call it desire to be happy or desire to be acceptable to myself. So this is, what is sadness? Sadness is the result, a reaction of self-non-acceptance. Sometimes it builds up into self-rejection. So that builds up into self-condemnation. And when does it build up? Sadness does not arise merely by one thought. It's a, it's a reason of build up of a thought. When same kind of negative thought keeps again coming again and again and again, there's a build up, I become sad. And if that thought continues to build up, I become depressed. So all sadness, all depression is the result of self non acceptance, self rejection, self condemnation. Therefore, the problem of sadness, the solution does not lie outside of myself. Sadness is not a problem centered on something outside of myself, it is centered on me. It is a result of psychology, but this is a spiritual problem. But generally we think that somebody else is responsible for my sadness. Once I saw you were saying, uh, people were there in front of him, he asked, Hey, this morning you don't look happy, you look sad, what's the reason? Swamiji, I have not received a letter from my parents since last three months, I'm sad. I asked another person, Hey, you look sad, what's the reason? Swamiji, I received a letter today. <laughs> hey, you look sad, what's the reason? Swamiji, I'm not married. How are you, Swamiji? I'm married. <laughs> Why you said, Swamiji, I don't have children? Why you said, because I have children? <laughs> the point is, our conclusion is that it is someone else or something else that is the cause of my sadness. And that's the reason why I keep on rearranging things around myself. So if I think that my furniture is not all right, I rearrange that, I rearrange my house, I rearrange my job, I rearrange my marriage, I rearrange everything. Hoping that I will be able to discover or create an arrangement which will be, which will make me happy. But the sadness does not arise from something else. Sadness is centered upon myself, upon the self. There are two kinds of problems in our life. One is a set of problems centered upon non-self, things other than myself. And there are problems centered upon self. Two kinds of problems are there. For example, hunger is a problem centered upon the body, not upon the self. So we have to recognize the kind of problem and then Seek an appropriate solution. Meaning that if I'm hungry, I should know that that's a problem centered upon stomach. Meditation will not solve that problem. Doing something with myself will not solve that problem. Hunger, thirst, poverty, all of these are problems, you know, in literacy. All these problems are centered upon non-self and therefore they require appropriate solutions. Meaning that, Swami, what solution Vedanta has for, for hunger? I said Vedanta has a problem, solution for all problems centered upon the self. There are two kinds of knowledge. As you can quote, Devidya Veda Paracha Iva Paracha. There is one lower knowledge and there is one upper knowledge. There is inferior or lower knowledge, a higher knowledge. Knowledge of physical sciences is one knowledge, knowledge of the world is one knowledge, knowledge of self is the other knowledge. So we require both of them. Because we do really have problems at the physical level, at the level of body, etc., at the level of environment. So we do need that knowledge to solve those problems. 
But the problem of sadness cannot be solved by something outside of myself. I remember my own self many years ago, working in a place in New York City. I remember it was 4.30 in the evening. I found, find myself going down from my office to where there was those uh, vending machines, put a coin and get a candy. I was feeling bored. I was feeling not good. So what do I do? Get a candy. Watch a show, go to a movie, this is what we do. So when we don't feel so good, when we feel bored, when we feel sad, then we adopt this kind of solutions. But they are all solutions centered upon outside of myself, whereas sadness is not the problem, is, is a problem centered upon. But Swamiji, when I watch a movie, I do feel good. And I said, it's an escape. At that time, I'm able to somehow avoid confronting myself because my mind is distracted and therefore I don't want to deal with myself. As soon as the movie is over, again I come back to where I was. Or sometimes the movie itself can trigger something yet. And again, I may come back to myself. The point is that sadness is a problem faced by every human being. It is a problem centered upon the self and therefore it should have a solution also centered upon the self and not centered upon non-self. Meaning that my rearranging the world, which you may do, I have nothing wrong in it. If it is too hard, we can turn on the air conditioner and make it comfortable. It's too cold, use the heater, make it come, nothing wrong in creating comfort, it's quite okay. But if I think that by air conditioner I will become free from sadness, then we can't expect. For that, a different solution is required. So freedom from sadness is what Vedanta teaches, Bhagavad Gita teaches. What is the solution? If self non acceptance is a problem, self acceptance is a solution. By my not accepting myself as I am, I'm unhappy, accept yourself as you are. That's it. Who is Swami? I accept myself. This is all the problem. But unfortunately, just by declaring I accept myself, acceptance doesn't happen. Acceptance has to happen. It, it can be will. Suddenly it can be will, suddenly it can happen. Like love. I can't will. I love you, okay? No, that doesn't, you know, it has to happen. Love has to happen. Otherwise it will be so nice, so easy. There is no problem, no conflict at all. If the spouses are living with each other, if they can, the, the love is a solution to all problems of relationship. And opposite is a problem for our relationship. So if love can will, then I can always say I love you. And then I, if love happens, that will be wonderful. Doesn't happen. Meaning that this love, happiness, acceptance has to happen. So what can we do about that? We can create conditions conducive for that to happen. Sleep has to happen. I can't will sleep. I mean, even if I will, I don't, don't fall asleep. What I can do is to create conditions for sleep. A comfortable bed and a comforter and temperature and fan. Whatever I, you know, I, I create conditions. My pillow is the right height. Comfort is of the right kind. Fan is the right speed. My room is essentially dark with one small night lamp. That's what I can do. Sleep has to happen. So you love also. I can bring the gift. I can do things. Which situation can be conducive for love to happen? Similarly, self-acceptance has to happen. And I must create conditions 
for that to happen. What do I do? I do things such that I am inclined to accept myself. I invoke from myself an acceptable self. And we will talk about one or two things that we can do. One is that Lord Krishna teaches in the Bhagavad Gita that you will be able to accept yourself when you can accept what is around you. So Lord Krishna teaches what he calls graceful acceptance of what is. There are certain realities of life. Very often we do not accept those realities. We resist the realities. We reject the realities. Very often. So there are realities of life. What's a reality? For example, when there is birth, there is going to be death. It's a reality. When there is day, there will be night. It's a reality. Like there are two sides of a coin. Similarly, life also is made of this opposing pair, opposing pairs. Heat and cold, pleasure and pain, birth and death, success and failure. This is what life is made of. Unfortunately, what I do is, I accept the life partially. Success I accept. Failure I don't accept. Comfort I accept. Discomfort I don't accept. Honor I accept. Dishonor I don't accept. But honor and dishonor. Success and failure. Gain and loss. So these are the realities of life. What is the reality? Something that I have not created. Something that I confront. I have not created birth, I have not created death, he is there. I have not created success, I have not created failure, he is there. I have not created honor, I have not created dishonor, because you decide whether I am honored or not honored. The world decides whether to honor me or dishonor me. So there are so many such things which are not in my control which happened to me, which I have not created, which I do not control. Thus in life there are many, many things that we do not control. This famous serenity prayer tells us that attitude. I will change a few words and say, God give me the maturity to accept gracefully what I do not control. Give me the maturity and courage to change what I can control. Thus in our life, in every situation, there are two things. Things that I, which I can control, things that I cannot control. Right now, I can control what I am, you know, what I have to say. So what I talk is under my control, generally speaking. Even that also sometimes is not in my control. A lot of times we talk about, we say things which may later on we regret, means that it was not in my control. But let's say that when I am giving you a talk, usually what I am saying is in my control. But whether you listen to me or not, Even after listening to me, whether you will accept it or not, after accepting, whether you will understand it or not, I mean whether you understand or not, after understanding whether you accept it or not, after accepting whether you will adopt it or not, all of these I can't control. 
the purpose of my communicating with you is they will listen to me, they will understand what I am saying in the way I am seeking to convey. Everybody understands all that, but whether they understand what I mean or they understand something else, so I, I wish that you understand what I am saying in the same way meaning which I intend to convey. After understanding what I say, I also expect and hope that you will find it reasonable, find it acceptable, find it right. After finding that, I further expect that you will put it into practice. Well, that is when all these talk or discourses would have served the purpose if it can bring about some change or transformation in the listener. Otherwise, if I remain intact, which very often we do, after listening to things for years together, people sometimes remain intact. No change at all. In that case, all the listening has not helped. So we hope to change, transform, benefit from this. Now whether all that will happen or I can't control. Thus in every situation there are things that I can control and things that I cannot control. What can I control? What I do is what I can control. And what will be the outcome of what I do is not in my control. What I say is in my control. The outcome, whether you understand or not, whether you accept or not, is not something in my control. <clears throat> Therefore, since it is my habit to judge myself always, if I have to judge, I should judge on the... How should I judge myself? I should, at the most, judge myself based on what is in my control and not judge myself based on what is not in my control. Meaning that, should I consider myself successful? What is my criterion right now, for example, for declaring me successful in my own mind? One is, if I say what should have been said by me, and very satisfactory, meaning my action, which is my control, if that is done properly, that's one way of judging that I did well. I'm all right. Second way of judging is whether people understood or not, people accepted it or not, people do they respect me or not, do they congratulate me or not. That is what is called outcome, which is what I do not control. And Lord Krishna says, do not judge yourself based on the outcome which you do not control. Judge yourself based on the action or the effort which you control. But unfortunately, we keep on judging ourselves based on outcome. Whenever we perform an action, it can be anything. Playing tennis, basketball, maybe an app sport, maybe a test, maybe my work in my place of work. I'm an engineer, a doctor, a professional, a farmer, whatever I am. Generally, we judge ourselves based on the result or the outcome of what we do. And it is quite likely that since outcome or the result I do not control, therefore it is quite likely that the outcome may not be in keeping with my expectation. Today, I judge myself based on the result or outcome of my effort. The 
therefore, when I appear for a test, I already have a target for myself. I should score such and such number of points in my test. If I do that, I'm successful. If not, I'm a failure. This is how I decide for myself. No, it's very something I can't control. All I can control is prepare for the test, appear for the test, write the test paper. What the outcome will be, I do not know. In India in particular, you know. <coughs> Sometimes they used to say this is a joke. These people are burdened with so many answer papers which they have to crack within a certain period of time. So every day he may have to collect maybe a hundred answer papers, you know, to meet with his goal of correcting so many answer papers within a week or fifteen days. He doesn't have that much time. Answer papers are very long and he has to read everything and then what? He doesn't have time. And very often he doesn't have a mood also. He may be, after waking, he is having a cup of tea and his wife made tea and there is not enough sugar in there or too much sugar and he just gets upset. And, and so then he starts examining those papers. So then, in what mood that fellow is examining the test paper, answer paper? If he is in good mood, then he may be favorable in, in you know, judging, scoring. Not in a good mood, he may not be favorable. I appear for an interview. Depends on the panel of people who are interviewing, in what mood they are, in what, you know, what is the state of their mind, all of that will, dis it will, will play a role in whether I am selected or not. Thus, whenever I judge myself based on outcome, I am setting myself up because Outcome is something that I do not control. It is controlled by factors which are not in my control. A simple example is shooting an arrow from a bow. I have a target. I would hit the target. So it is quite in order that when I am shooting an arrow that I have the expectation to hit the target. It's not that I just shoot arrow anyway, yes, I won't hit the target. And therefore, I train myself and I do what is all required to release the arrow in such a manner that it will hit the target. But there is no guarantee that it will. If there is a guarantee, nobody will ever lose in the Olympics, it's not so. There are shooting competitions, all kinds of competitions are there. If I could control then nobody will lose, isn't it? But big champions also lose sometimes. The most favorite, you know, in the, uh, in the French Open, <coughs> Wimbledon, whatever else, and right they lose in the semi-finals, in quarter-finals. <coughs> Meaning that if I could determine or control what the outcome is, then nobody will lose. But we know that people lose. That means that, in spite of the best effort, the outcome is not in their control. Now, as I said, I always have a habit of judging myself and evaluating myself. What should I judge myself on? If I judge myself as acceptable based on the outcome, if outcome is successful, then I'm acceptable. If outcome is not successful, I'm not acceptable then there can never be a, 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 a certainty of whether I will find myself all right or not. And unfortunately in this world, the failures are more than successes in everybody's life. And failure is what I declare failure, understand? That, they, that being the case, there are always going to be many more chances of my declaring myself a failure and disapproving of myself, disliking myself, feeling bad about myself, feeling sad. If I have to judge, this is not to judge, but sir, I have to judge myself. The one thing I can do is to judge myself based on my effort and not 
based on the outcome. But once the arrow is released from the bow, then the arrow is no more in my control. As long as the arrow is in the bow, so long it is in my control. Once I release it, it's not in my control. And whether that arrow will hit the target or not is not determined by me, it is determined by the laws of physics, laws of nature. And those laws are not created by me. Those laws are not controlled by me. In fact, very often I do not even know all the laws involved. I may have a fair estimate of what the outcome would be and accordingly I plan and I execute. But regardless of that, I can never have the total knowledge of all the variables involved in determining an outcome. It can be wind speed. It can be something which I, you know, at that time the wind starts blowing. And my calculations may not work. So that being the case, there are so many factors outside of my control which play a role in determining what the outcome will be. It is unfair on my part, unfair to me on my part to judge myself based on outcome which I do not control. I should be fair to myself. See, fairness is a value. First thing I should be fair to myself. If I have to judge myself, I should judge myself based on the effort which is in my control. If I feel that from the outcome then I can learn whether my effort was alright or not. Sometimes it's out. Then I can always improve, I can always change. But if judging myself based on the outcome is not in my control, in which case, there are all the chances of my declaring myself a failure, feeling dissatisfied with myself, unhappy with myself, sad with myself. So this is lesson number one. And that is, do not judge yourself based on what you do not control. If you have to judge yourself, judge yourself based on what you control. Then Swamiji, what do I do with this failure? What do I do with the outcome which I don't control? What do we do? Well, accept gracefully whatever the outcome is. What is accepting gracefully? Accept gracefully means you welcome it or relate to it without any frustration, without any rejection, without any resistance. We resist those things which we do not like. We resist, we reject things that we do not like. First of all, I have decided what I like and what I do not like. And then I resist, I reject, I react to what I consider not likable by me. So Bhagavad Gita says that now, you do not judge anything. Don't judge the outcome. The, the laws, the universal wisdom judges what the outcome is. So who decides where the arrow falls? If I do not decide, who decides Swami? The universal wisdom decides. The universal wisdom the universal laws, they decide where the arrow will fall. And let me respect that judgment. Because I was hoping for a certain outcome based on my limited wisdom. Whereas the outcome is decided by universal wisdom. So I should respect universal wisdom and I should admit, okay, it was my limited wisdom. I let go of my demand that I should be right. I submit 
my limited wisdom to the universal wisdom, my limited ego to the universal wisdom, and accept the judgment of the universal wisdom. Without what is acceptance? Without resistance, without rejection, without blaming. So this attitude, or what is called graceful acceptance. When enable me to remain free from unfairly judging myself. Graceful acceptance of what happens? Because what happens is not controlled by me, it's controlled by the universal wisdom, by universal laws, which I have not created, which I do not even know in their entirety. Never I gracefully accept. The Swamiji. How can you gracefully accept failure? Who says it is failure? Who declares it to be a failure? Oh, but my arrow did not shoot the target. Is that a failure? Is that a failure? Why do you call it a failure? It's an event. So do not brand an outcome as a failure because I am branding it. Nobody has said that I should brand this or that, never. I refrain from branding something as success and failure. Don't brand success and failure. Brand what happens as what is right. Arrow hit the target? Right. Thank you, universal wisdom. Did not hit the target? Thank you, universal wisdom. Well, how can you thank? Because then you learn. When things do not go according to expectation, if I have this attitude of not reacting, of not rejecting, then I'll be able to maintain what we call an objective frame of mind, a non-reacting frame of mind. And if that is so, I'll be able to learn from that event as to whether I need to change, whether I need to do things differently. A reacting person is not a learning person. A non-reacting person is a person who can learn. And a person who learns is a person who grows. So our life should become a process of learning and growing. But that can happen provided I am a non-reacting person. That can happen when I gracefully accept. I do not demand that things have to necessarily conform to my expectations. On the other hand, I change my expectation to conform to what happens. This attitude brings about a slow transformation in me. Because when I hold on to my expectations, then there are reactions. On the other hand, I let go of my expectations in the face of what the reality is. In that case, I become released from the burden of expectation and judging myself. Thus, Bhagavad Gita says, do not judge an event as success or failure. It is an event. It is what is right because it is so determined by universal wisdom, so it is right. And therefore, gracefully, objectively accept it. Don't judge that. If I don't judge that, I don't judge this. Understand it. Even a failure is not our problem. You know what is our problem? Our problem is, I am a failure. That is our problem. If I do not succeed, I say, okay, I, you know that, I'm, that my effort failed. That's okay. But you know what we say? I failed. See the difference between the two. The effort failed is one thing. I failed is another thing. Effort failed is no problem, it's a reality. I failed is not a reality. Therefore, do not judge yourself based on that. Don't declare yourself to failure or success. For success and failure are both objective realities. I do not superimpose them upon myself. And then in both the situations, I can live an objective, non-reacting, meaning accepting. When I accept that, I accept myself also. And thus, I am free from sadness.
But as far as well, you have not said, then what? If you have not said, you are happy. We need not, fortunately, we need not do anything separately to become happy. All we need is not create this sadness for ourselves. If you don't do that, we are happy. How can you say there is family? Because happiness happens to your nature. It is the sadness which I have created that deprives me of that happiness. And thus, when I do not create sadness by the self-judgment, self-impositions, then what remains in happiness? This is a wonderful thing. Vedanta says, you don't need to do anything to be happy. You do something to be unhappy. When we are unhappy, we should know that we have done something. Which we do not do, then we are happy. Happiness is our nature. Therefore, we do, all we need to do is not reject ourselves, not condemn ourselves. Then there is self-acceptance. When there is self-acceptance, acceptance, there is happiness. There is no sadness. So one of remaining free from sadness is called graceful acceptance of what is. What I cannot control. Every minute I confront a world which I don't control. What should be my attitude? Of graceful acceptance. It is in order. What is graceful acceptance? It is in order. I don't reject it. I don't resist it. I don't blame it. I Remember, remind myself, it is right. <coughs> what is, is right. In order, because what is, is the creation of universal wisdom. Therefore, it should be in order. But Swamiji, sometimes people are unfair to me. My boss is unfair to me. It is unfair to me. Here comes a, another, what we call trust or faith. What is the faith? The faith is there is basically fairness in the universe. So whatever universal wisdom does is always fair. I don't accept so many. Well, how do you, how do you judge something unfair? Based on the limited wisdom. So we say that whatever is, is a creation of universal wisdom. Every moment, whatever presents itself before us is the creation of universal wisdom. If you call it God, you may. And it, 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 it fades that this universal wisdom, that there is basic fairness, there is no reason why it should be unfair. There is no reason why creators should be unfair to me or to anybody. Well, I don't see so many, it is unfair. This is what you think right now, under this mental condition, you judge something as unfair. But sometimes we do not know what effect the present event will have after ten years. We don't know. What I think is wrong or unfavorable or failure at this moment, under this state, state of my mind, I do not know what effect it will have Later in future, I don't know. Sometimes we we'll look back at our life, we find that what at that time we consider wrong or a failure, I sometimes tell myself, thank God I did not get admission in that place, thank God. That time I was disappointed. <coughs> thank God I was not accepted here, you know. So I have to do only this, I find out the activity, what I find is, Whatever I've done, I, I find myself situation in life, they're right for me. Meaning I'm no good for anything else. I'm designed only for a few things. And I find myself in those circumstances. And so, when we look back, then we find there is reason for accepting this fact that there is a basic fairness. There is whatever fairness, there is grace, there is that in our life. With that faith, we can even accept, we can even swallow a very bitter pill. Even bitter right now, some bitter pills sometimes are required for curing disease. So sometimes you get bitter pills in our life. Why does the universal wisdom give bitter pills? Maybe I need, because there is some disease which needs to be cured. 
when we grew up, we always grew up in those days, we used to go to Ayurvedic physicians, you know, for a treatment of little things, you know, some fever and cough and cold and stuff like that. Go to Ayurvedic physicians. If some of you are familiar with Ayurvedic medicine, he is always bitter. Now, time comes, nine o'clock in the morning, I need to take this medicine. I know it is bitter, I don't want it. But my mother, it is her duty, her job, to make sure that I take that medicine. So she catches hold of me. If I do not cooperate with her, she puts me in her lap. With one hand, she presses me. If I don't open my mouth, she presses my nose. <laughs> mouth is open. And that spoon of bitter medicine is thrust in my mouth. I, in India, we were very obedient. Here the child was like, Mom, I hate you! <laughs> no, we didn't say that. <laughs> Sometimes it looks like she's very cruel. She's cruel only to be kind. Similarly also sometimes it looks like what is happening is very cruel. But it may be like bitter medicine. It may have something in it for me, for me to learn, for me to grow. This is a general attitude. That pain comes in my life to grow. Pleasure comes in my life to encourage me so that I don't, you know, become truly disappointed. So now and then it gives me a little pleasure, a little bit. But pain generally comes to grow. This is a general attitude. In which case, I will not become disappointed, will not become frustrated. Disappointment, frustration is, even though I expect outside, it is always about myself. I will not be disappointed with myself, frustrated with myself. When there is self-acceptance, there is happiness. There is no sadness. So self-acceptance happens when we have that attitude of mind, which is graceful acceptance of what is. That creates an attitude of mind in which self-acceptance happens. We cannot will, it has to happen. We create condition where it can happen. That condition is a condition of mind created by the attitude of graceful acceptance. We face that what is, is in order. What is, is fair. What is, is right for me. Even though it may not so appear right now, but in all faith I accept it. So this is an important lesson as far as freedom from sadness is concerned. What is what's the reason of sadness? Self non-acceptance. What is the solution? Self acceptance. We can perform meditation of self acceptance. It may be difficult sometimes to do in the heat of the things, but when one is, you know, I'm by myself, have some leisure time. Not a pressure to do things, at that time I sit down and remind myself, tell myself, remind, accept yourself, love yourself as you are, love this body as it is, love the mind as it is, love the intellect as it is, love your achievements as they are, love your failures also as they are, accept and love yourself as you are. If we decide to do that, we'll find it. Yes, I'm all right. So we can perform this meditation on self-acceptance. It's an attitude we want to maintain constantly. But we can practice it when we are by ourselves. It's what we call meditation. Deliberately accepting that my, my body is all right. Mind is all right. My career is all right. Mind is all right. I'm all right. So self-acceptance is the solution to the problem of sadness. Problem of sadness. Okay, I conclude here. You have a few minutes to go. If you have any questions.
Do you not have a microphone? No, okay, okay. all right. Just one minute. Yes, sir. How, how can there be progress if there is no desire to accept everything as it is? Can there be progress? Yeah, this is the usual question. That if this attitude of accepting what he is, where is the motivation to progress? Where is the motivation to change? My first question is, what is the purpose of progress? Why do you want progress? So that you can be happy, isn't it? <clears throat> but if by acceptance you're happy, if you're happy with what is, what's the need to change it? The need to change comes when you're not happy with what is. If happy with what is, what's the need to change? That's one thing. Second thing is, progress is not, doesn't have to be always for ourselves. Progress can be for others. If I am happy with the way things are, I find that others are not happy. What can I do for them? So that will be a very healthy motive for progress. Chasing your ambitions and therefore there is no leisure at all. But otherwise, all we need is a certain leisure time, maybe some minutes in a day set aside for this, when we can take stock of the situation. <coughs> it's a matter of priority. If you have a value for taking stock of situation, if a value of understanding ourselves, where we are coming from, what is it that we need? Through all these activities, what is it that I want to, what I am seeking, what do I want to achieve? Since we have concluded that what I want to achieve is in terms of something out there, in terms of my career, in terms of my income, in terms of my position, whatever, so we are chasing those things. If I understand that, what really I am seeking to achieve is satisfaction with myself. If that understanding is there, then perhaps we will be able to make time for understanding what brings about that acceptance. It's mainly our conclusions which drive us to do what we do. But when that conclusion changes, if you are exposed to this teaching, for example, then we will not be blindly running or chasing things. We will be also looking at ourselves, our attitudes, our motivations, why the attitudes are what they are, what they should be, etc. I don't know, did I answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Partially. Partially. <laughs> Yes. Hi, um, in the beginning, you talked about uh, the need, well, using distraction to not be with self. And I find sometimes I can watch the news 
and get upset, you know, and I'll walk, walk around and be upset about something that's on the news. And I can understand that that's me not accepting an external circumstance. But is the, is the appropriate action to know that when I watch the news, I get upset and I should not watch the news anymore? Or should I work it on myself and just try to accept that what I'm watch, when I'm watching the news, uh, these are out external things that I cannot control? Right? So watching the news, I get upset because, again, I have an expectation of what should be. If I let go of my expectation and accept that it is something I don't control, that's what it is. And uh, in that case, you will have also the leisure of deciding, can I do something about it? What can I do about something that happens in Iraq, so for example, or Afghanistan or X, Y, Z? So will you remain frustrated? Well, you can pray. If you so feel that something should be done, then you can do what is within your control. But basically, accepting this is a reality. There must be a reason. There must be a reason behind what is happening. We may not know the reason, or we feel it's not acceptable to us, it should not be like this. But the fact that it's happening must have some reason. And, again, what the reason is, is determined by the universal wisdom. So I accept it. Accept doesn't mean that I can know it, understand, you know. Accept and I do not react to it. That's all called acceptance. Not condoning, not agreeing with it. Accept means not reacting. Okay, oh, this is what it is. But I do not reject it. I do not dismiss it. I do not deny it. I accept, understand, and then decide my attitude, whether I want to do something about it. I just keep quiet, whatever. Hmm. Yes? I have the same question as him and wanted to ask it, uh, Swamiji. Like, uh, essentially, there are so many things that we feel saddened from outside influences, right? Not mm -hmm. just from ourselves, which you um, mm -hmm. touched upon a lot. But um, there are a lot of things that sadden me, for example, torture of animals, for example, or every second slaughter of animals is going on. Um, our world resources is depleting every second and we are um, exploiting it to the core. Um, so there are many things like that, right? So uh, as you said, Iraq or like uh, poverty, the, so many things are there. So, but these are really happening. I mean, we can tend to uh, accept it but the fact that someone else is suffering is causing suffering, right, to ourselves. Um, is there some way to... Obviously, we would like to change things. We can't control the world. That is uh, acceptable. I mean, that I have accepted. <coughs> we can only take small steps. But for every one step we make in the forward direction, there are probably ten steps going on the reverse side. So I don't know how to handle that. Uh, if your pain is because of pain of somebody else, is acceptable. If your pain is because of yourself, your ego, your expectations, your demands, then that is what is the problem. If your pain is because of your sensitivity and your pain because of somebody else's pain, that is quite okay. There is no saddening. It, 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 it is pain. Sadness or depression is a different thing. Pain is one thing, sadness is a different thing. You are pained at somebody else's suffering. That shows your sensitivity. And that perhaps will motivate you to do something. If nothing else, pray. That is, that will not cause sadness or depression. Pain is that is generated in me because I do not accept something. It's not in keeping with my demands, my expectations. That is when it becomes a problem. You follow pain is one thing, sadness is a different thing. Hmm. So I think um, you know, one thing is sometimes that sadness is so there when you have so much attachment to things. You know, you 
want things to be differently, and you're trying to face realities, but you may or may not be able to. And um, you, know, you know that graceful acceptance and you're trying. So I know yesterday we talked about some tips of how to release that attachment, that, that binding, that attachment, and how to gradually release that hold so that you can find some space to then try to get to the graceful acceptance. Right. So, when you say attachment creates sadness, it is a sense of personal loss that creates a sadness. Not something that happens out there to somebody. But what that means to me, that when I feel there is a personal loss to me, that is what causes sadness to me. That something happened there to somebody is one thing. What it means to me when I judge that, that means there is a loss to me, it is that loss which causes that pain. And when I feel that, that also is okay. Even that pain also is okay. That pain need not make me depressed. But when there is resistance to that, why uh, I somehow hold myself responsible? Sometimes what we do is we hold respon ourselves responsible for something that happens somewhere else. And we start judging ourselves. So that depression or sadness comes from self-judgment. Not even from uh, pain that comes as a result of uh, some loss. Pain is okay, and that we have to go through. Yes, it is true that there is an attachment. It is that attachment is dependence. That ours depend upon a certain person, let us say, for my comfort and happiness. The departure of that person now leaves me, leaves me deprived of that comfort and happiness. And that's why I feel lost. That's why I feel unhappy. So, love is one thing, and when we become dependent upon the object of love for our happiness and comfort, then it's likely to cause that kind of unhappiness and sadness. It's going to happen. But is it possible for us to love and not become attached? To love and accept things as they are? then if we find satisfaction from love, from what I'm able to do, without the consideration of what I'm able to receive, if my happiness comes from what I receive, then when I stop receiving that, naturally there is a loss. My happiness comes from what I do, then it will be much less. But we get used to, we, you know, we get used to receiving and then becoming dependent upon that. And then when it is taken away from us, there is a vacuum, there is a sense of loss. Then you have to process that, you have to go through that. As long as you understand that this is the reason, so long it will work out. I really am, I'm unhappy because it's, I have, I have, I'm, I have a feel a sense of loss. Why? Because I inadvertently became dependent upon that source for my comfort and happiness. And that's why this happened. Okay. So even understanding the cause of why I'm feeling what I'm feeling also is very, uh, it also goes a long way. 